Are you in uh, Hamilton? I mean, in uh, the Toronto area, or are you in the States? Or? I'm in the United States. I'm in northern Minnesota. Oh, I see. Okay. I get a lot of requests, and I didn't. I, I had switched uh, um, Facebook and stuff. I had some problems with different people, and I had two going at once, and I wasn't talking to one guy, and he was still putting stuff in and fighting with the other person that was doing it for me, and then that person got a bit goofy, too, when I... I said I wanted to uh, kind of combine them and whatever, so um, okay. I apologize if I didn't get back to you. And what, who am I speaking to? Uh, Sean Salasson. Sean Salasson. Okay, Sean. Okay. Oh, uh, I'll just do a little introduction, and we'll just kind of start here. Sure. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Frankie Salasson Show, and uh, as we continue my series on Frankie's Icons, a pop culture series, uh, today we've got a very special guest, uh his name is Smith Hart, and if that name is not familiar to you, you would know his entire family as far as part of the uh, Hart family wrestling legacy that they have built for over the last oh many many decades in Canada and of course in the USA. Uh, welcome to the show, Smith. Thank you, uh, Frank or Sean or whatever your name <laughs> is. I, uh, I'm not good with names, but uh, Mr. Schlossen, uh, good to be there after this delay over the winter. Yeah, yeah, it was nice uh, that you uh, responded back. Cause you know, sometimes I'm not even aware if the if the person who's running their Facebook page is actually them or or if it's somebody else. Sometimes. Yeah, I can identify with that too. <laughs> so, uh, like I was saying in the introduction, uh, you come from the biggest legacy wrestling family legacy that I I can definitely say in no demand, especially in Canada, uh, the Hart family legacy. And uh, if people don't know anything about you. Uh, how did uh, the whole thing kind of? How did it all start? Um, well, I'm fairly, uh, I'm a fairly private person, just like uh, most of my brothers. Even though they do have, uh, you know, considerable fame, like my dad was that way too, kind of just, uh, you know, a, a modest person, but probably more so than I am. But uh, uh, you can't escape the public, and when you're dealing with the public, and they're putting uh, food on your table, and you got 12 kids, like I was the oldest of my parents 12 kids you have to uh appreciate the public and respect them and give them time so i'm i've always been accustomed to doing that and uh without uh fans and uh patrons you're not gonna go too far in uh commercial sport these days so uh i'm i'm always available and uh i'm, I'm actually honored to uh you know any any time i can uh, address the fans or talk to them individually i'm always good for it Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and that's what's kind of nice. Though. I, I like the fact that, that you know, even though you, you have such a big legacy under your belt, that you seem like a very down-to-earth type of guy. <clears throat> yeah, I am I'm, uh, I am very down-to-earth, and uh, I'm not like some of these uh, sort of wannabe homos and uh, prima donnas washed up all the bodybuilding queers that uh, won't sign an autograph for a uh, a crippled child who's waiting, who's, who's got, got cancer, and uh, you know they, they walk by him and with a sneer or something, even though he's sat there for eight hours. Uh, I, I don't like to hurt people's feelings, especially when they're well-meaning wrestling fans. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely understand with that. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, for people who don't know, you come from the the great legacy of the the Hart family re- rest legacy, like we've covered. Uh, from parents Stu and Helen Hart, and uh, give kind of a, a, a bio of kind of what your father was like uh, and how he kind of started this whole revolution with the Hart re- Wrestling Legacy and can, uh, Stampede Canadian Wrestling and stuff like that. Um, my dad was uh, kind of your average big farm kid. Uh, the, he, his uh, father, my grandfather, had been uh, double crossed by. Uh, uh, some agent bought selling property back in those days when they would sell homestead, uh, uh, you know, uh, sections of land in, in Tofield, Alberta, uh, with a crooked judge and uh, the town hall fire and all this and that. They, he ended up where he was evicted from his own property, and uh, you know, my grandfather and the children were put in a Salvation Army home, and I think my maternal my my uh, paternal grandmother was already dead by then my dad's mother died when he was fairly young but uh my grandfather being a stubborn old guy he stayed in a tent on the railway siding along the uh 
the road allowance or something, and they still threw him out, and uh, the, all his belongings, pictures, records, whatever, were uh, burned. To, you know, they got nothing. I think they saved a butter churn or something like that. It's a real miserable story. So my dad grew up in poverty and uh, through the dirty 30s, and uh, as did my mother. They, she came from a much uh, more affluent background, and her father was an Olympic track star, Harry J. Smith. Uh, that was her maiden name where I got my first name. He broke the uh, world record for the mile in 1912, and he competed. Oh, he was on route to Stockholm uh, in the, for the uh, 1912 Olympics, and he hurt himself in training, but he had already established the world record anyway. But Jim Thorpe, uh, who also wrestled among his many other uh, athletic attributes he was on board that ship as well my dad later met jim thorpe in new york but uh, anyway uh in fact in 1912 my dad was even born he was you know, born 1913 uh -huh. but uh, he he and my uh mother's father got along very well both being olympians and uh you know having uh, a common interest in in uh my mother oh sure uh, my dad was in the Navy at the time, and to him, that was a big step up going to the Navy. That was uh, like going from, uh, you might say, from rags to riches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He'd been working in slaughterhouses and shoveling salt uh, to make an extra dollar a day, uh, shoveling salt out of boxcars for the hides. And, and uh, if you didn't do it, if you didn't get the whole boxcar empty by a certain time, then you didn't get paid, so it was a gamble. You could work, uh, you know, do 90% of the work and get nothing. It was hard, dirty, filthy work with no masks, no goggles. They didn't even supply gloves. But anyway, uh, you know, and my dad one time told me how he'd found a, a bag of gelatin left outside the Gainer's uh, packing plant where he worked, and uh, that supplemented his food for a month. It was like a meal a day. Uh, you have a big cup of gelatin, however, and whatever you do with it, you know, if you eat it like the powder or you cook it or throw it into something, but those were hard times, and he he uh, managed through those hard times. A lot of city slickers wouldn't uh, recognize a bag of gelatin as a food source or anything, but uh, he used to shoot rabbits and gophers and things and squirrels, and they'd eat them, they'd supplement their meals with, with that, and they'd have gardens and stuff. But he was always kind of a farm boy, and you could call him a country hick, you know, but uh, he was actually fairly a good... Uh, he was pretty much self-educated and uh, always valued education above and beyond anything. You know, uh, you know, sports was secondary uh, to all of us, uh, uh, particularly wrestling. But he always wanted all of his children to get a college education, and most of them did. <coughs> and my mother was very uh, intellectual. She was accelerated twice, and she had a, a scholarship for uh, uh, Barnard, I think it was called. Uh, similar to Vassar, you know, he only got in uh, by scholarship, and her other sister uh, was also accelerated twice and was a Pi Beta Kappa at uh, Vassar. So my mother was uh, very uh, uh, intriguing to my father, and he he uh, he really fell for her because she was so sophisticated, and I think she kind of fell for him because he was kind of rustic and uh, he had a you know very good build, you know, a tremendous build of an amateur sure. wrestler. And they, they met in New York, uh, kind of by chance. But uh, to start with, my dad had a two-week furlough uh, when he was stationed in Halifax and during the war, and he hitchhiked with another wrestler, Gene Kaniski's partner, Sandor Kovac, and uh, were both aspiring wrestlers and uh, Sandor didn't have much amateur background but my dad had, had tremendous amateur and uh, submission wrestling background and was Alberta was the uh, Dominion champion light heavyweight of Canada so he was just kind of gawking at a poster the way a country hick might do for the first time he was uh, en route to New York but he was in Washington DC at the time where uh, Vince McMahon's grandfather Jess McMahon uh, was a, a stooge for uh, Toots Mont, who was the biggest promoter in the world at the time, for, for wrestling at least. And uh, Jess McMahon, Vince's grandfather, was uh, the lesser partner of uh, Tex Rickard, who they promoted all the Jack Dempsey fights. And when Jack Dempsey had retired, they had uh, a lot of rings at their disposal that they didn't need, and they sold them to Toots, who could now put a ring in some of the arenas without having to drag one along and, and set it up. They'd have one there on hand. So that, guy, that was his uh, opening into... Uh, and being a promoter himself, you know, they kind of worked out well. Oh, yeah. 
uh, Vince Senior came after that, and then and Vince Junior, and of course Shane, and Shane's got kids now. So I think my dad knew five or six generations of McMahon before he died. Uh, but um, anyway, when Toots came out and saw my dad staring at the poster, he said, "These are my boys." You know, I'm the promoter, and my dad was, you know, duly uh, flattered and impressed. And, and, and Toots said, "You look like you wrestle." My dad had a 22-inch neck and cauliflower ears. <laughs> And he said, well, I'm, uh, <clears throat> and my dad was modest. Yeah, I fool around with wrestling. I'm uh, the amateur champion of Canada and this and that. And it uh, turns out they both knew uh, Jack Taylor, who had trained uh, guys like Frank Gotch and, uh, and Toots and uh, Farmer Burns and different ones. Jack was the real deal. He was like the, uh, the dominant, uh, legitimate force in wrestling for years. A huge guy, you know, six foot four, and he had hands like shovels, like, my dad's hands were huge, and my dad's father's hands were even bigger. And this Jack Taylor apparently had hands mm. like a bear with your shovel, like this huge. Once he grabbed you, you could almost grab all the way around your neck. You couldn't get loose. He had wrists that were as big as most people's ankles. He'd run, like he'd be finished his jog by about 6 in the morning. He'd run, I heard, 20 miles, and he'd be squeezing two tennis balls the whole time. And by the time he got back, his balls would be limp, and he'd have no life <laughs> left in him. He's that kind of a guy. But yeah. a real gentleman, clean, sure. living, non-womanizing, non-drinking, non-nothing. Just, just you know, no, there was no steroids. Weren't even imagined back then. So that that was my dad's ticket to come back to New York after his honorable discharge and just uh, be part of the roster. So he did, and through that, he started wrestling in New York. And Paul Bosch, uh, who was a wrestler and a promoter and a war hero, he was a lifeguard and wrestler in. Uh, New York City area, Long Beach, in fact, and that's where he introduced my mother and my father. And uh, you know, my mother had four uh, younger sisters; they're all nice-looking girls, and uh, they were they were well known on uh, you know Coney Island and and uh, the boardwalk in Long Beach area because of uh, my grandfather's Olympic uh, prowess. He ran for the Bronx Church, and uh, he ran in everything, like the Milrose Games and the. Uh, as I said, the Olympics and the uh, Boston Marathons and all kinds of things, Pan American Games. And he had a, a huge collection of solid sterling uh, uh, trophies, and some of them had gold inlay on them as well. Some of them were big enough for a child to sit in, like they're as big as a, a fruit basket, some of them. Huh. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> that's how my parents got together, and, uh, you know, my mother was very, you know, she... When she got to Calgary, she got stung by a bee in the house for the first time. She'd never, you know, been exposed to bees living in, you know, on, near the ocean in Long Beach. And, and then later, in, uh, I think she was living in an apartment above a library uh, when my dad met her. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, she she was not, she was a total city slicker. And, you know, being out with yeah. horses, work horses and uh, piles of manure and, uh, you know, horse flies and, you know, whatever you find on a farm, that was totally uh, kind of important to her. And uh, but she she kind of uh, you know, and she wanted to have a ranch house with just on one floor, you know, and modern new. And my dad found this old kind of haunted looking house built at the turn of the century and twenty one room mansion, and that's where we were all raised, uh, pretty much. And uh, you know, that that was a, a fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, utopian setting for twelve kids growing up. Yeah, I'd say so. It's very uh, private. I mean, it was a yeah. huge house, and and it overlooked the entire city. Yet it was uh, <coughs> there was no development going west from the city because it was a uh, you know, you're approaching the foothills, and water was a concern. So they kept expanding east, west, east, south, and north. And uh, even though they sprawled way out, like you go twenty miles in any direction from downtown. And you're still in the city. I think Calgary's actually as big as Los Angeles as far as sprawling goes, but certainly not the population. But they didn't go west for a long time. So we were very isolated out there in this, you know, our 35 acres in a big 21-room house, plus the carriage house. And, you know, we had uh, a lot of, my dad, we were all raised on, uh, you know, goat's milk and cow's milk, right on the real that we milked ourselves. And uh, we always had uh, a fruit garden and a vegetable garden. and my dad was very big on uh, health, you know, we, we didn't eat white bread and we didn't use a lot of white uh, flour and sugar and stuff, everything was whole wheat, whole grain. Uh, my dad was pretty big on milkshakes and stuff, you know. And, uh, 
we were all very big, healthy kids, you know. Like we we thrived, and, and uh, we were our own unit. Like uh, you know, nobody was lonely there. We had twelve kids. We never had very many friends over because it was a mile walk to the school. And uh, you know, you had to cut through a big uh, farm, which later became a park. So you know, there was just you know, it was just uh, us, you know. And yeah. my mother didn't drive, so we we're always there. We never went anywhere. We you know, once in a while, when there's a good Walt Disney movie like Davy Crockett or Old Yeller or whatever, we'd all go in the, one of my dad's limos and we could find a spot in, in the drive-ins and yeah. uh, you know, but we all, it was like the family was our own you know team. You know, we we didn't need playmates and uh, visitors because uh, you know we kind of just were our own. You know, we, our, we all had each other. So, so do you? Uh, do you miss that house? I mean, do oh, you yeah, miss absolutely. The... I don't miss the house so much. The guy that bought it bastardized it. As far as I'm concerned, he did oh, a splash oh. job on it. He got well, good, a lot of good funding for it. Oh, the city, so that he wouldn't demolish it. But uh, I don't think he could have demolished it. It was designated as an historic site. But yeah. Anyway, he he was an opportunistic guy who had uh, some fairly. Uh, you know, aggressive, shady lawyers that uh, slipped in and bought it from the guy that let his option expire on it. We were going to sell it to BD Homes, and uh, on midnight when the date expired, uh, the lawyer, uh, who had, he was a bit of a wrestler himself, uh, amateur wrestler, and he, he knew Natty Neidhart, I think he went to school with her, so he, he approached her and found out the details of what it was going for, and uh, when the offer expired and all that, and then he slipped in with another offer that gave another uh, 50000 for all the antiques in the house. Well, one of our chandeliers alone was worth 35000 We had six of those. So we got all those for the 50 plus there was some uh, monstrous uh, hand-carved oak, uh, Scottish oak you know, things that were 200 years old. And he got all these, it was beveled glass and curved glass and huh. you know, all this heavy-duty stuff. He got everything, all the Persian carpets and marble tables and the whole entire Chippendale uh, dining room set that sat 35 people for all for this extra $50,000 price and the executor of the will said oh this is great we don't have to fight over anything well it wasn't really that great but uh, it didn't really matter to me uh, <clears throat> the, the money was insignificant uh, you know the loss of my father was 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 it was significant uh, yeah. to all of us and, and um, you know I, I miss the times at the house. I don't miss the the bastardized version of the house now. He sold all the land around it for condos that haven't happened. They haven't happened yet. The economy's not that good. Huh. And uh, you know, whatever. It's just I, I don't even recognize the house now. He took where there was a you know maybe a, a forty thousand dollar chandelier. He's got a little cord hanging down with uh, some little light that Jeez. looks like a volleyball with a bulb inside it. You know, it's ridiculous for a house of that vintage. And that size to have a lousy little light. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's in bad taste to have ceiling lights in the in the uh, living room. That's what my mother said anyway for years. But had floor lamps and table lamps there. Yeah, but you got the house my dad yeah. adored, and he picks it up. Uh, it had an incredible view of the entire city and beyond and before. You know, it had everything. You could see everything from there. And uh, he did sell some of the land in front of it. And, the uh, people that bought it, of course, and you can't begrudge them. They built condos almost wall to wall, like 20 units per acre or condos, and they blocked the view pretty much from the main floor. But you could still see it from the next two floors. And that's where the the famous dungeon was. Too. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure exactly. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that you have for, from that because I, uh, I I believe uh, you know the late great Chris Benoit was a part of that as well as you know, your entire family and uh, your dad pretty much had a a, a big training you know, it was like a training yeah. camp. Well, my dad had the gym basically for himself and for the uh, kind of uh, individual private use of the wrestlers any who wanted to because a lot of times a uh, controversial wrestler like Abdullah who probably didn't work out but. The Stomper, who was very much a fin uh, fitness uh, fanatic, and or even uh, Killer Kowalski for, for years was very dedicated to uh, bodybuilding and conditioning. But so many of the wrestlers, the fabulous kangaroos, Al Costello and Roy Heffern and, and uh, Celie Samara and Woody Strode and uh, oh, uh, Gene Kaniski and um, so many that, that uh, passed through did, did want the privacy of a gym where they weren't uh, maybe being challenged or uh, uh, 
taunted by fans that didn't like them. You know, a lot of wrestlers are very uh, well and uh, controversial, and you just had a bloodbath where you screwed the local hero. Uh, you don't want to be at the gym the next day. Maybe there were some ethnic ones to challenge you because you just uh, apparently kicked the living shit out of uh, <laughs> a Hungarian freedom fighter the night before. Yeah, that's well, for them. Like that, never charged anybody a nickel. Never really tried to train anybody. And but they would they would pursue. Like Gene Kaniski was one, and uh, the Stomper Archie Goldie was another. He he came by. Like he was at the wrestling as a kind of half mark, half uh, uh, skeptic uh, detractor, saying, "I can beat your champion. I can beat Dave Rule. Maybe he could have beat Dave Rule. I don't know." But uh, he was just a young upstart kid playing football and driving a Coca Cola truck. He probably a dropout, and uh, sometimes the fans would say, "What's the matter, Stu? Let him have his chance. What are you afraid of?" And all. So my dad finally took Archie out in the back of the pavilion. He said, uh, "Don't uh, bet that some of these guys wouldn't maul you, punk." You know. And he says, "If you want to really work out, come out to my house sometime." Because Archie lived out of town, and uh, if you, you know, let's see how how you do with me. You know, my dad was more or less. Assuming the role of promoter, some of the commissions wouldn't let you wrestle and promote at the same time. In some towns, you could. So, my dad wrestled where he could when it was necessary or when it was uh, feasible and advent- advantageous. You know, yeah. but other times it wasn't worth it. It's bother to wrestle. You know, it's uh, you know, you associate maybe the matches being uh, rigged or some gimmick if you're the promoter and the wrestler both, but. Anyway, my dad, the fans had. Uh, my dad was already established with the uh, fans in Alberta. Anyway, in Saskatchewan, is the real deal. You know, they'd seen him wrestle and knew of his uh, amateur background, and he also played football for the Edmonton Eskimos in the uh, CFL. Okay. Even set records for kicking with them, and some of them may still stand. They did for uh, quite a while, and I think some of them may still stand. So, uh, so like uh, in your family, besides your brothers uh, Brett and Owen. How many uh, of your uh, other members of your family uh, wrestled? They all wrestled to some degree. We all took amateur wrestling in uh, at the YMCA and in uh, junior high and senior high and even in university. Um, none of my sisters wrestled, but they all married wrestlers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most the most famous would be Davy Boy Smith, who married Anna, and her son Harry is a tremendous wrestler, and the WF kind of passed him up. They, they uh, you know... They used them, I would say, and use, I would emphasize the word use. Yeah. Him, uh, you know, his, his, his debut match was against uh, uh, JBL, and uh, he, he, he didn't even defend himself. He just was like a dorm. He was worse than a doormat. He just got punched out, and he didn't even throw a punch or block a punch. He just he just got you know slapped around like he was a, a scarecrow or something or. A bolo, one of those, uh, bolo, those blow up uh, dolls that you punch, you know. Like yeah. Didn't even, didn't even give him a comeback, nothing, you know. And then they had him do a homosexual, like the break back dance or something afterwards, you know. Like his last day he was there, he had to, you know, do a Brodus Clay kind of dance. And yeah. I don't know why they, why, why they try to humiliate good talent like that, you know. Yeah, that's you have sure. a pension for it, you know. Almost every guy that's black and over pounds has to do a jitterbug or some kind of dance or with, with little girls from the audience and stuff and uh, maybe they like it maybe it sells I don't know to me it's uh, it's, it's, it's buffoonery and uh, it's an insult it's, it's like a, a rib on these poor bastards yeah and and, the, and that's just the thing too it's like uh, you know like I, I've always been a big wrestling fan since I mean I'm only 29 years old so I've been a fan since at least 1990 and I've watched a lot of wrestling and and I know the difference between what's real and what's not real and stuff and and what what do you think of of, of it when people say that uh, wrestling is fake um well Gene Kaniski had a pretty good uh, word for that you know about uh, he said uh Something about you're like a eunuch in a harem, you know all about it, but you've never done it, you know. Mm-hmm. People that are. wouldn't last five seconds in a, in a ring with anybody, with a small amateur wrestler or, or a, a blimp like, uh, um, you know, like Mark Henry or Brodus Clay, but. <laughs> And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I like both those guys, but I mean there's an old Tiger Tommaso used to sometimes at the wrestling matches. Some somebody that was in attendance would come up and say, uh, 
this is all fake. And Tomaso would say, did you pay for that ticket? And the guy would say, yes, I did. And he'd say, well, you're an idiot to pay for something fake. <laughs> but uh, it isn't fake. It's whatever. You know, wrestling used to be well, it's kind of evolved from the gladiator days. And uh, I can see how uh, if you can make it look as though you're killing each other, yeah, especially, you know, when you're in a coliseum where the, the fans are quite a ways away from you from the action, you know, you could... I've even seen it in bullfights and things, too, uh, where, you know, there was man against the bull with nothing but a knife in his hand, and it was, it was like, slipped in his wrist, and he had the uniform, you know, the matador outfit on, and this was a wrestler named Manuel Quintana who uh, fought a bull in Mexico. He wasn't a matador. He didn't have the picadors or the toreadors on horseback, nothing like that. He just had the himself against the bull, and I don't know if they cut the bull's cord on his neck like they usually always do for the uh, bullfights. So the bull's already half yeah. dead or screwed. He's, he's done. He can't, he can't, he's, he's, you know, mortally wounded before he even starts the fight. I think his whole thing is a sick bunch of, it's bad. I uh, hate stuff like that. But, um, you know, you, you can, uh, if you, if you can play, if Superhawk killed the bull, he slit his throat or something and it died right there, but uh, it, it didn't, he didn't appear to have any weapons, but he had this thing strapped to his arm like Gazelle on uh, Marathon Man. It was a big knife that was, he didn't see it because it was kind of hidden in his hand, but the his blade was hidden, but it was taped up to his forearm. But um, I can see where things maybe evolve where gladiators, wrestlers to get, get together and say, listen, uh, you know, I'll clobber you, but I won't really hurt you. You know, I'll give you a good stiff one, you know, and uh, you, you feign death or whatever, or submission or whatever, and I win, and we both live to fight another day. That makes a lot more sense than two guys going out and, killing, you know, beating the shit out of each other, and then one dies, and one's so wounded he can't wrestle or can't perform, uh, you know, in the his Coliseum for another year or something. I mean, who needs that? Yeah, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, MMA. By the way, I uh, I respect these guys for having courage and stamina and being very well trained, uh, very disciplined athletes, uh, courageous, uh, you know, all of that. But uh, I think there's it's ridiculous. This is, we're supposed to be civilized nowadays. I know the world is sort of on the brink of another big war for to solve the economy of the big the big boys you know in the poor countries and the Arab countries gonna, and the Islamics and whatever are going to have to put the bill and lose a lot of blood and lives but um, it's, it's, it's a lot of manipulation in uh, in the world and uh, I, don't, I don't like violence I think it's uh, you know you can simulate violence for entertainment uh, in movies that's basically what you know and wrestling is like a live form of that. It's like drama with uh, the re- addition of uh, a certain amount of reality, and uh, especially in, with blood. Uh, it was always the legitimate blood. Nobody ever used blood capsules or uh, you know ketchup or chicken yeah. blood, all those stupid things. You know, <laughs> may have been uh, you know self-inflicted, but at the same time, uh, nobody knew that then, and they really shouldn't know it now. But uh, Anyway, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that wrestling is fake. I would say it's uh, it's um, it's sensible. It's it's like it. You know, the object of wrestling is uh, pro wrestling is to uh, make money for the uh, wrestlers and the promoters and anybody else that's attached to it. You know, the uh, exhibition boards are pretty. They're they're about as ruthless as any pawn shop owner when it comes to money and uh, uh, rent and stuff. They don't give anybody a break even when you're doing a charity show for the uh, CNIB, which is the National Institute for the Blind, or disaster fund like for uh, Oklahoma, or uh, my dad's first one was for the the uh, Springfield uh, mine in uh, Nova Scotia that collapsed, and I don't know how many miners were killed, and they were pulling them out for, for a week or so. We ran a disaster fund, and 100% of our money, none of the wrestlers... Uh, got paid and understood that they wouldn't get paid and were fine with that. All the program money went to the uh, to the disaster fund. The more we could donate, the better that it, uh, it looked on us. But the exhibition board never gave us a break once. They would never even give you a discount, let alone free rent. You know, even if you're running there year round, so it's five fifty two weeks a year. Uh, so I don't have a lot of regard for such uh, entities, but. 
you know, there were, you know, there were sort of three necessary evils that you had to always comply with in pro wrestling. One was the commission, one was the exit, you know, wherever your building was. And the, uh, without, and when you lose one of those, you're out of business, you know? Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of it's kind of nice to be able to, in case everybody, anybody's wondering who we're chatting with, we're chatting with uh, Stu, or not Stu Smith. That's my middle name. Yeah, Stu, Smith, Stu, Stu yeah. Hart. Uh, he is the eldest of the uh, Hart family, of, of the brothers, or all of the kids, anyway, that uh, Stu and Helen Hart had, and there was 12 of them, and, and that's a big family. And I gotta say, you know, your, your, your brother Brett, you know, to me, was one of the greatest wrestlers to ever, ever perform, you know, Bar none, and he's he's always been one of my favorites. I've never had a chance to meet him or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, I agree but, with you. Uh, and, uh, most people would agree with you. He was a tremendous athlete. Yeah, so what, he wasn't like a, a giant. Some yeah, guys get, get pushed right up to the forefront like Giant Gonzalez because he's you know a freakish proportion. Yep. but really he wasn't. Uh, you know, he was a di- heavy diabetic basketball player. Didn't speak English, and I guess he was Argentinian or something. A nice guy. But uh, he filled the bill a little bit there when uh, Andre the Giant wasn't always available. He was in big demand, even though they had the contract on him for years. <laughs> but uh, and even Yokozuna, pretty good, pretty hell of a guy, and he came from a Samoan background. Yeah, he, he was, a, you know, but he he was, uh, you know, had some kind of genetic obesity and whatever. I feel terrible that he died. He was, I like, I loved the guy and all his uh, family, but. Um, Brett didn't have, uh, you know, he didn't have the uh, Mr. Universe build like, um, you know, say Hulk Hogan either. And Hulk was a big, uh, a big version of Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of. But uh, yeah, was. Brett wasn't uh, a vain, uh, greedy asshole to the extent that uh, Hulk Hogan was or the Ultimate Warrior or some of these other guys. Uh, he was. Uh, he was willing to share and give. You know, when you wrestle somebody, you you, make, you, you can you can make them look fantastic. Like there was a guy named Tom McGee, who uh, looked better than Hulk Hogan, was bigger than Hulk Hogan, much younger, probably a whole lot better person, uh, clean living and whatnot. And uh, he wrestled. Uh, I think it was. Uh, well, I can't even think of the guy's name. Uh, some Italian wrestler, one of the Italian stallions or something, uh, uh, Tony Marie, Tony, uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, the guy didn't didn't give him anything. Like uh, Tom, Tom had learned how to wrestle with us, and mostly he learned uh, how to perform. You might say he didn't learn a lot of submission wrestling and stuff. He was kind of so impressive uh, on his own. But uh, when he wrestled this, um, I can't wish I could think of his name, uh, Mark or something. He's some, uh, but anyway, he, uh, well, first he wrestled Brett, and Brett made him look like a million dollars. And Brett hadn't even wrestled him in Calgary. Brett was already with the WWE by then, WF by then. And uh, Tom came in, and my dad was very impressed with his physique, and he was world's strongest man, and he won several of those contests and whatnot. So he wrestled Brett, and Vince was ejaculating. He said, "This is my new Hulk Hogan." I'm, I'm sure Vince had a, a, a you know. A, long-lasting erection when he saw it. <laughs> and then uh, we a day later, this guy wrestled uh, some Italian guy that uh, was pretty, uh, ate him up, didn't do it, and Vince, Vince has, uh, got flaccid then and didn't even want to look at him again, and he never, they never used him again. He got into acting, lost all his weight, and I don't know what he's doing, modeling blue jeans now or something, or he may have even turned queer for all I know, but Tom McGee was one of the best prospects ever, and uh, he was doing, he looking good in Calgary, and he was wor- willing, good, good, hard working kid, you know, and uh, giving, he gave it his all. But one guy made him look good, and one guy made him look like shit, and Vince, Vince couldn't deal with it. So you know, it's like you're, you know, everybody, somebody's mark, they say. Yeah, I'd say so, and. and uh yeah, so like I said, I mean, your your brother Brett was a, a really good wrestler, and I it's just kind of too bad that uh, that his uh, career ended the way it kind of did. As far as uh, I think his last professional match before he came back to WWE many years later was with yeah, Bill, that's too Bill, damn bad. Bill that there was all that time wasted with uh, you know he didn't he didn't he never wanted to leave. Uh, a lot of these guys are like hooers, you know, they jump ship in a second. Even Gene Okerlund apparently for an extra five thousand uh, dollars. 
difference and even try to negotiate back with Vince. He just jumped ship. Apparently, and went to work for uh, the, the opposition. Yeah. Uh, but um, Brett did not want to. He wanted to stick with Vince forever, and uh, he loved Vince as a father. And Vince apparently felt the same way about him. But uh, Vince kind of had a throbbing heart on for Shawn Michaels, and I don't know how Shawn felt. But uh, I don't think Shawn is so much gay as he is just a whore. But uh, <laughs> it's like the, the Hollywood starlet that wants to. Uh, join MGM or something, and uh, once she blows Louis B. Mayer or something, she's got a contract. But until that, she's she's nothing, you know. So, I don't know how all that dirty uh, homosexual politics works, and I don't I don't really want to know. But yeah. Um, anyway, I apologize if there's any uh, virgins listening. But anyway, um, the, the whole you know Brett 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 could have been you know like with wrestling being a cooperative. Uh, Entity where you know you you uh, work with each other, but you know it's an illusion where you you appear to be uh, at odds with the opponent, or you're here. You know when you throw your punch, it looks like it's a knockout punch, and maybe you know that's all great. Then if it isn't, all the better. I mean, uh, I, I wrestled the other night. Uh, you know, I'm 64 years old, and I helped a friend, Ruffy Silverstein Jr. Uh, he had a show out here in uh, Ontario. And, some a carload of his guys didn't show up, and he asked me if I could wrestle the guy, one of the guys that set the ring up, who was in training, but they hadn't actually had a match yet. And I said, sure. And uh, I gave the guy, uh, I, you know, you trust the guy with your body. He drove his elbow, the point of his elbow, right into my kidney, right on. Oh, I, wow. I bent over, for selling a nut shot, and he <laughs> drove, drove his elbow right into my, just between the spine and above the kidney and in the back ribs. I can hardly breathe even right now. And he, the kid's lucky. Little Kevin, lucky I didn't uh, give him an elbow smash that uh, maybe ended his career. Because you know I'm not the toughest guy in the world by any means, especially at my age. But uh, he's he's just a, a, a punk kid, and I, I wasn't I wouldn't hurt him. He didn't do it on purpose. And when afterwards I spoke to him about it, like, and uh, he said, "Oh, I saw the hearts like it stiff." I said, "I like it. I don't mind it's solid." I said, "Solid is one thing." and stiff as another but I said I was just stupid I said you might as well like thumb me in the eye or kick me in the nuts like what the hell you, you, know, you yeah. use your head yeah. I put the sharpshooter on him and uh, he was trying to go for the rope so I, I leaned I was you know putting it on like Chris Jericho really <laughs> just more or less standing because my knees already bad anyway one of them and I like escaped to the ropes where I'd have to break it and reapply it so uh, I just sat down on him hard, and then he then he tried not to tap out. So I had to push even harder, and I probably you know, I bet his back is aching as much as mine. But finally, he tapped out. And that was it. I was going to give him a lot more in the match, but uh, he was a, a bad boy, and I, you know, then I gave him a whack on the ass, like you know, just to let the fans know that uh, who was the master. But anyway, then I even got involved in my son Michael's match later, and we saved the show wasn't a great crowd or anything but uh you know and i left i didn't even if ruffy pays me he pays me if he doesn't he doesn't he's a friend and i don't i don't really care i did it to sort of for the sake of the fans that were there and for the promoter who was on the spot sure. so, so uh, you know yeah. it's, uh, I, okay. I try to help the sport however and whenever i can especially when it's something like this where i don't have to really travel or exert myself it's a pleasure to talk to you and to the fans and uh that's uh, that's where I am, you know. I, uh, I'm not that active anymore, but I am writing a book, and uh, you know, these uh, interviews uh, kind of help promote uh, the name and the hearts and the business and whatever else. Uh, you know, if it helps the radio, helps your uh, radio cause, uh, all, all the better. Yeah, and, and I appreciate having you on. I mean, it's it's uh, it's fun to be able to finally talk to you, you know, a member of the Heart Wrestling Legacy because I, like yeah. I said, I've never, I, I've I've only gone to a couple of wrestling events, still more like TNA events because they're they're the only ones that kind of came around my area. But I've always wanted to meet, you know, like some of the legends and stuff. Yeah. And it seems like whereas Vince McMahon has <laughs> uh, like sixty four page contracts, they're probably even bigger than that now. But all the toy uh, residuals and distribution of sure. all the uh, merchandising royalties and if you do this and you don't do that and pay-per-view and you know accept this and the, you know all these exemptions and whatever uh we had no contracts it was on a handshake like wild uh bill it was at uh, red wild red berry once said uh in an interview in uh wrestling illustrated he said wrestling is lily white 
that's almost an incendiary statement where people say like hell it's it's most uh it's the horror of all sports and stuff but what he meant was in those days even in the united states there was no income tax then and there certainly wasn't any in canada in those days <clears throat> you got paid that night in cash and if you weren't happy with the arrangement you would give the promoter a two-week uh, notice of your you know you want to quit yeah and uh, sometimes he'd even find you a place to go to if he, if he, you know, if he liked you, and uh, vice versa. If they didn't want you, they didn't figure, you know, they got too many guys like you, or you're not, you're not measuring up to what they expected or what they need. They give you two weeks' notice. That, you know, there's no pensions in wrestling. There's no compensation. There's no uh, unemployment insurance of any kind. Nothing. You get injured, you're on your own. When somebody in Calgary was injured. My dad would usually fly him home at his own expense or keep him on till he was healed if it wasn't something really serious, like a broken leg or something, where you're going to be paying a guy for six months to sit on his ass. But uh, if he broke it in, uh, you might say, in the, in the, the role of wrestling, uh, you know, and he was a nice guy and, you know, didn't, de- you know, didn't deserve to have his leg broken. Not, you know, he, my dad would take care of the guy. He might not pay him his full salary. He'd keep him going. He'd give him enough to live on, and uh, even then, some you know, he have some dignity. So oh, my sure. dad's word was his handshake, was his bond. Like he, nobody, nobody uh, they could call my dad up, and uh, most of them would just come in, uh, just say, "I want a spot. Can I come in?" And my dad would. Uh, usually play hard to get, you know, like, well, I don't need any uh, baby faces right now, or I'm a little heavy on heels, or I'm a little this or that, but uh, so the guy didn't expect a, a lot, you know, it's always better to uh, surprise him with more than they expected, than prom- bullshit them, and then give him less, you know, then, then he got hard feelings, so my dad would always be, you know, and that's how promoters were, they're a little cagey that way, they didn't need you, even if they were, like, looking for someone like you, they wouldn't admit it, you know, it's just business, Yeah. but, uh, you know, so, we had no contract whatsoever. They just come in and uh, they trust my dad to be square with them and give them the most they could get. Like you know, we didn't weren't you know these are small towns, far place, far away from each other. Horrible winters, you know. No. Uh, everybody's crazy about hockey here, and <laughs> even though back in those days the hockey would usually be with the, just the six teams would be finished before the Easter holidays was over. Now you're going right till June with hockey, but. Um, the, the fans, and right now there's no blizzards, but a lot of times, uh, you know, in some of the earlier playoff games, you get nasty weather, and the people are, you know, why go drive 50 miles uh, in a rural area to go to some town in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, see wrestling when they're going to be back next week anyway, or you're going to see it on TV anyway, and yeah. you can uh, stay at home and watch a playoff game and not have to pay for parking and babysitters and, you know, gas and all that BS but let alone the tickets and whatnot. So we, you know, it was for us to, to be straight with the wrestlers and give them uh, a fair share of the gates, uh, even when there was no money in the gates and you're losing. My dad would dig it out of his guts and pay them anyway. You may, they might have got, you know, obviously they get more when there was uh, great crowds, but uh, very seldom. Only, there's only a very few turds that I can recall ever that uh, didn't agree with my dad's payoffs and, you know, they're, they're, there's some of them are fairly famous around here, but uh, basically uh, they trusted my dad. And even sometimes when it was, uh, you know, he'd have to kind of gradually, uh, you know, sometimes it was a long, the, the 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 long picture, you know, that that really, you know, if if you two weeks, three weeks into the game, you know, you might not have got what you were thinking of getting, what you thought were, you were expecting, you know, that, that, you know, my dad would allude to a lot of things, you know, without really coming up with a specific figure. But in the end, he'd take care of these guys, you know, say, look at the overall picture, and they'd say, wow, I did, I made more money here than I made anywhere else, you know, even though if, if some of those first weeks were a little, a little shy, a little scary, you know, like, uh, my dad had to kind of cover his ass. He, he would have been a multi, multi-millionaire long before he uh, sold his property and, and made money that way, like he, we just to support twelve children in the fashion he did, uh, and then keeps them all being educated and yeah. well posed and all that, uh, took a lot of effort. I mean, my dad bought my mother a Singer sewing machine, and she was not mechanically inclined. She never drove a car, never had a driver's license, although she was well on her way to getting one when she had a horrible car accident in Montana. 
which left me alone with my, you know, I was staying with my grandparents who had never had a son and the four sisters who had never had a brother. And they were, you know, they were my dad, my grandfather always wanted to uh, carry on the Olympic tradition. But I, I ended up to, due to that car accident <clears throat> staying with my grandparents till I was three. Okay. By that time, I came back to Calgary, and my parents had the huge house and two brothers that I'd never met. Bruce and Keith were both born in Montana, where the car accident was, and they had to, you know, my mother had to stick around there, and actually she flew into uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic for uh, in Minnesota for, for some surgery and back to New York for some dental surgery and whatnot, but basically... Uh, she was. She broke every bone in her face, and uh, my dad broke the steering wheel of his Chrysler Imperial with his chin didn't even loosen his teeth. He died with no cavities and a full set of teeth. And uh, huh. it was just, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was basically. I, I, I think I was a little. I, I never bonded with my parents that much. I was afraid to ask my dad about, you know sex and things like that. The birds and bees would yeah. never ever explained to us. My dad would watch the goats and the dogs and the cats and we ought to figure it out, you know, and I, I agree with that. Basically, I never really gave my kids any instruction on that kind of stuff. Uh, I figured it's nature and they'll figure it out and it's embarrassing and they don't want to talk about it any more than I do. <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, you know, I don't want to get off the topic here, but uh, I would like to say, like it was was Brett. If he hadn't been double crossed by Vince, uh, he wouldn't. Uh, you know, like he was he was gun shy of all, all the times he'd been betrayed about uh, getting the title back. And of course, he's going to win it back from Hulk, and then this, and then that, and then Sean has to have it. Sean was getting all the attention, all the interviews. Brett was not getting any interviews. Uh, Sean was selling all the merchandise. He wanted Davy Boy to turn heel. He wanted Brett to turn heel. So Brett Brett became anti-American, pro-Canadian. And uh, you know, it just it just whatever. Uh, some people influence people, and there's a lot of backroom politicking and cliques and stuff. And it really shouldn't be. Even in, in our circuit in Calgary, there was the odd click, the odd time, and yeah. occasionally they get bold enough to try and make a move on you, where they're all going to leave if they don't get so much. Yeah, that's for my sure. dad was pretty good at dealing with those guys. He's pretty good at calling their bluffs and stuff. And we we weren't like in New York with us, literally hundreds of wrestlers uh, in the near area of surrounding states. Uh, there was nobody up there. We couldn't just all of a sudden snap our fingers and conjure up uh, a roster of wrestlers. Uh, so when my dad called their bluffs, it was a calculated risk, you know, and most of the time uh, they'd back down and some of them would defect and you know, all of a sudden they didn't have a click anymore. It'd be a couple of guys that were turned on one guy that tried to pull it off and He'd be ousted off, but, you know, my dad wouldn't get rid, you know, he was a firm believer in don't throw away your dirty water till you got the clean water in hand. So he'd use these bastards. David Schultz was one of them. Uh, over the years, there was a few others, but uh, anyway, I, I always liked David Schultz. I thought he was uh, talented, but, uh, you know, it's just a kind of a funny story. Uh, he'd been calling my dad to get him to influence Vince to use him and you know Honky Tonk and David Schultz were the ones that really broke in Hulk Hogan years before and Hulk was supposed to be going into the bat for them and in fact he did he got Honky Tonk in and actually David Schultz finally got in too but uh, he was working for Vern Gagne at the time and he'd call Vince up and I imagine from what I hear uh, Vince uh, knowing that he was a clutch player and kind of a uh, potential s uh, snake in his bosom uh, would say, "Gee, Dave, uh, you're such a good talker. I don't know who I got that could work with you and it'd be up to your standards, but let me call you back in a month or when you get back to me in a month or two or you know, let's wait till after the holidays and call me in the new year. And then Schultz would call my dad up and ask him if he could get Brett to talk to Vince or do convince the kids to uh, recommend him and all that. And, you know, but anyway, one time uh, Schultz, uh, like you know, the lion looking at the wounded lamb or something, he, he sees uh, his opening. He'd run a show in Denver. And I always thought Vern was a pretty much a gentleman and stuff, and Greg was a, an honorable, great person. But uh, he, he didn't overpay his wrestlers, and uh, you know, I don't think any promoter does that too much. But uh, um, Sergeant Slaughter had wrestled Hulk, and neither one was happy with the payoff. They had had a huge crowd in Denver, and then uh, there was a big return match coming in two weeks. 
So Schultz calls Vince up and he says, if I can get Dean Okolo in to quit and Sergeant Slaughter and Hulk Hogan and Paul Orndorff and Ken Patera and myself, I'm not sure if there's anybody else. <laughs> uh, and Vince said, if you can get them all to quit before the next show, fuck yeah, I'll, I'll sign you all up. So that's what happened. The, that, that crippled Vern right there. Oh, and, uh, wow. Vince was a little shy about just taking on Schultz. And then Schultz, true to his form, he... Uh, they switched, they put, uh, he was supposed to be involved with um, with Mr. T and uh, Orndorff or something. Uh, I don't know what happened, but they used Piper or Orndorff and Mr. T and Hogan or something. And Schultz was out. He was originally in on the tag match, and then they they, they, they decided not to use him. So he vowed he was going to attack Mr. T because he couldn't, I don't think any of the other guys he could have managed. I mean, he couldn't beat up Shaw Slaughter or Patera or... Uh, you know, I don't know about Hogan, I guess. But anyway, um, they, 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 they drummed him out. They all they were ready for him. And he, when he went out to guzzle poor little Mr. T, they, the armed guards and secure, normal uh, WF security all surrounded him. And he was hauled out of the building and found and gagged and never heard of again. He became a bounty hunter. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I, I like I said, I, I appreciate you having you on. I, I got one last question for you before I let you go, and it's right. it's a simple question. Uh, the question is, uh, what uh, what legacy or or what? I, how can I rephrase this? Uh, what legacy do you want uh, people to to know from the legacy that your family made that you want them to remember? You guys have. Um. Oh, I don't know. Uh, just uh, I guess um, you know. My mother called wrestling the the most uh, you know the the most brazen form of burlesque or the lowest form of burlesque going or known to man or something. And she's kind of right in some ways, but she she disdained wrestling. Whereas my dad loved it. My dad loved the idea of uh, of submission wrestling um, because you can match somebody you can sort of maul them and control them without really hurting them like you know a cat can play with a mouse for hours before it, uh, before he crunches it and or, or he can let it go or somebody escape on their own the cat's not paying attention the mouse is playing possum but uh you can master a guy and, and he's he's yours and, and he's 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 rag in your hand he's not even trying to you know he's he knows he's been uh, bested and he's not hurt. He hasn't had a concussion. He hasn't had his nuts kicked or his, uh, you know, MMA with all the fists and elbows and knees and uh, kicks to the face and head and all that a blind swinging and, you know, hitting as hard as they can, as fast as they can, as often as they can, as soon as they can. And you're doing the same to them. Uh, to me, that's that's combat. That isn't really sport. That's There's no fun in that or that's, you know... Uh, I, I, I uh, sort of I, I I get excited when I see a kind of a pure wrestler beating a, a guy that uh, likes to kick people in the head, a kickboxer, or, you know, strictly a, a strike artist. But uh, I I wouldn't want my kids in it. It's too it's damaging. Like uh, you know, you can there's all kinds of uh, brain impairments and speech impediments and vision impediment uh, that you get developed from you know and hearing uh, impairment that. Uh, comes from that, and uh, you know, even the other day, uh, John Jones just about ripped his toe off. He, he's pretty much done. With, you know, he kicked so hard he, he snapped his toe off. Uh, you know, I don't know why they 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 wear protective cups, but they, you know, to me, my brain is more valuable than my testicles at this stage <laughs> in my life. You sure, know, sure. Players are wearing shin pads and the face guards. Football players got face guards and shoulder pads and all kinds of pads. Here's these guys out there striking in the face, and they got no head headgear protection. I think it's stupid. You're asking for trouble. You could get a thumb in the eye and be blind instantly. Uh, you get all your teeth knocked out with or without the goddamn teeth. I've uh, seen, you know, even in wrestling, uh, Carl, Carson, Carl, Carl Carlson got uh, 18 teeth knocked out from a blind elbow from Riesel Point one time, and they, they didn't hate each other. It was just a miscalculation there was a blind a back elbow or something and you know it was just a dent I'm sure Maurice felt as bad about it almost as Carl Carlson did you know I, I, even one time a fan threw a bottle at, the, at Penny Banner the villain and she's wrestling June Byers and just as the bottle was winging down a big a thick coke bottle Penny uh, pulled up and she had uh, June in a camel clutch kind of thing and she just reached in her hair and pulled her up a few inches higher 
and it hit her square in the mouth and uh, broke all her teeth off and broke her palate and stuff, broke her lips and nose, everything. So, it's, you know, things happen anyway, and to go out there and deliberately be trying to pretty much, uh, you know, you know, it's, without the wrestling in, uh, addition to MMA, it's basically two gladiators just out there uh, striking each other, and uh, that isn't so much sport as violence, I think. You know, it's uh, brutal. You know, it's barbaric. So, you know, I, I get, you know, you can't help but get excited sometimes when you see some guys who have been taking a lot of punches and really looking bad, and then he, he rallies and maybe puts a submission and hold on the other guy or just holds talks to the other guy. You get, you know, but uh, I think it's, 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 uh, these are civilized times, you hope, at least in, in uh, North America and the first world, and I, I don't, I don't get it. You know, you might as well, they might as well legalize street fighting and, and pit bull fighting and stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to close by saying that uh, you know it was a pleasure to talk to you. But I, I want to say that like when uh, Shawn Michaels had uh, when with that Montreal screw job, the the, uh, the real gist of it was Brett could have beaten Shawn Michaels all day long if he'd wanted to. Oh, yeah. mean, Shawn didn't have a choice. Like if they said you know if uh, he had to have Brett's cooperation, Brett, Brett had to kind of go along with the story, or they wouldn't they wouldn't have probably let the match go on because Sean couldn't control it. Brett could have. Brett was the master. Sean was the, the puppet, you might say, but <laughs> the puppet had the uh, promoter's ear. Oh yeah, and uh, that's why Brett was uh, double crossed. Brett could call the shots. Brett was in the position to demand that uh, certain things had to happen, even though he'd already been turned into a, a heel, pretty much, even though he was a pretty well established babyface by then. And, no. Uh, Oh yeah. Well, I, I tell just you, like to let yeah. the fans know that uh, I'm uh, marrying a real wrestling fan. One of my, uh, you might say, childhood sweetheart, uh, Stacy Angel from uh, Calgary, and I'm not sure we were engaged. I haven't set the date yet, but I've been getting a lot of uh, calls about it and uh, internet uh, queries about it. So I just <laughs> want to let them know that it's on the level, and uh, I'm uh, not sure where it's going to happen or when. Uh, I'm due to go to Puerto Rico, but then uh, I, I was also thinking of uh, Chicago as a place for this marriage. So huh. it, uh, it's a big thing to me. I've been widowed uh, three times, three yeah. times. My children have passed on uh, in, in young years, and uh, I've, uh, I'm sort of looking forward to this. It, it's changed a life for me. Uh, you know, I've been you know single now for like you know, 21 years. So. Okay. Well, congratulations. It's a pleasure to talk to you yeah. and your fans, and good luck to you. Yeah, yeah. thanks for being on the, the show, and uh, like I said, your family will definitely have a legacy that will last for generations to come, and uh, it's just an honor to finally get a chance to talk to one of the hearts. Thank you very much. Hey, no I'll problem. You. Yeah, you too, man. Bye. And that was Smith Hart, <laughs> all the way from Canada, Ontario, Canada. I just got done uh, talking to him on the phone here. And, uh, yeah, he definitely can talk, that's for sure. There, There is definitely no doubt about that. Uh, well, anyway, I want to thank uh, Smith uh, personally just for uh, being a guest on the show. Uh, his stories are definitely legendary. I mean, we could have probably talked for, you know, like I've said with other guests, you know, for hours upon hours upon hours. But, you know, due to time and stuff, and I don't want to keep these interviews that long, but... But I, you know, when it comes to somebody like Smith Hart and, and the legacy that his family has built, I mean, you you know, these interviews are, are not just going to be twenty minutes long; they're going to be almost an hour long because there's a lot to tell. And and you know, like I said before, you know, in past interviews, I don't like to ask the same old questions all the time. That's why we didn't talk about Owen. We didn't talk about you know, you know, the Canadian uh, Stampede Wrestling because a lot of people talk about that stuff. And and I didn't want to make the interview. Uh, you know, since I've never talked to the guy before, I didn't want to make the interview, like, you know, too dramatic or whatever, because a lot of people probably ask about Owen and stuff like that, and, and you know, Owen was one of those wrestlers, too, that were was definitely a legend and should be in the WWE Hall of Fame and should be, you know, in, in the Hall of Fames everywhere, and, uh, and probably will be one day. Uh, I just didn't want to, uh, like I said, keep the interview uh, on a downside. I, I, I want to keep it up. I want to make it uh, as uh, legendary as I could, so... Anyway, I appreciate uh, Smith being on uh, for this, uh, what what turned out to be almost an hour-long interview. But uh, his family definitely uh, would uh, definitely uh, not only have a wrestling legacy, but uh, would be icons of pop culture in their very right, uh, 
no matter what. So I'm Frankie Slauson, and uh, we'll see you again for another great edition of the Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture series that's going on all summer long. And I hope you guys have been enjoying some of the guests that we've had on, or I've had on. Uh, there's definitely more uh, to come, so uh, keep it here. YouTube.com slash Frankie Slauson Show. Bye-bye. <laughs>